fact, this choir is going to be singing at camp meeting in just a few more weeks. I believe it's June the 21st. I believe that's right. It'll be here before we know it, and we're very proud of our choir and our musicians, and it's good to know they're going to represent our church at the state camp meeting in June. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Good to see you here tonight. We appreciate your coming to be a part of this service. Didn't we have a wonderful time in the Lord this morning? Praise God. Thank the Lord for His wonderful presence, for His Spirit that ministered to us. I want to remind you that this coming Saturday, the widow's banquet, all ladies are invited to attend. And uh, the brunch is going to be a brunch at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning in the fellowship hall. So you don't want to miss out on that. Don't forget that uh, we have our prayer gathering beginning Wednesday night at uh, around 7 o'clock at the West A. Kannapolis Church. And we have Brother Mitchell Toll who has preached before. He is a, a great artist as well as a great preacher. And he will bless you. And uh, also Brother Doug Small will be the Bible teacher in the morning. Ladies uh, meeting will be on Thursday morning. The youth service will be on Friday night. So it is a few nights, but it's packed full of some great services. So be in prayer if you can't make it. Be praying that God will bless in a great way. Would you stand as we get ready to go to the Lord in prayer? Remember those tonight that are sick, need of God's touch. We have a request for Ralph Smith. He asked for us to call for his name in prayer tonight. He's having some, some difficulty with uh, his legs and with blood clots. Also pray for Sam Whitehead, Sister Linda Dye's brother. He's in the hospital. He has pneumonia. Also pray for Bo and Debbie. Debbie came home Friday, but uh, she's still got a long way to go, so pray for their healing. Also for Brian Hunt. We continue to pray for him. Sister Willary Sloan, as well as Brother James Griffin. Brother Griffin developed a kidney stone on Friday, and uh, he's hoping it will come to pass. And also Perlin Bremer is out today. She is sick. Let's pray that God would touch her. Do you have unspoken requests? A lift of hand. Let's believe the Lord for these tonight. Pray for this service. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of prayer. We know, Lord, that we can call upon you and you'll answer. We can seek you and we can find you. We can bring our petitions and our requests before you and know, Lord, that there's nothing too hard for you to do. We ask you to move upon these tonight. who are in the home or in the hospital. Lord, those that are in rehab, those that are going through great difficulty, we know you're able to heal them and restore their health. Remove the pain. Remove the discomfort. Lord, let them feel the effects of our prayers even now. We ask you to move upon the lost above all, that they might call upon your name to be saved. We ask your blessings tonight, that your will be accomplished in this service. We'll be careful to give you all the glory, praise, and honor for all you do. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another? To the Matthews Church of God, we're delighted to have you with us tonight. Merciful God, we thank you, Lord, for your sweet spirit that's here tonight. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to bless you and offer, and may it be acceptable in thy sight. In your holy, wonderful name, amen. Give God the glory. Come on, stand with us and sing. Give God the glory. Give you the big 
together. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. You have no hope. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. We declare it tonight. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Hallelujah. So let us give God. So let us give God. Come on, church. So let us give all of the praise come on say it again all sin in the blood of Jesus is against you hallelujah sin in the blood of Jesus is against you there's still power in his name sin in the blood of Jesus is against you so let us keep God so let us keep Come and give God, so let us give God all of the praise. Somebody ought to give Him praise. Come on, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, lift your hands across this building. How many of you know when you're weak and tired, He gives you supernatural strength? <laughs> His grace is sufficient. All we got to do is ask. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reach this to me. Come on, can you declare that tonight? You are my strength. Let him touch you tonight. Strength like no one. When I feel like I can't go on. Strength like no other. Reaches. Reaches to me. Come on, sing that again. You are my strength. You are my strength. When I'm weary in my mind. Strength like no other. Such a strong God. Strength like no other. Reach this to me. In the fullness of your grace. And in the power of your name. You lift me up. lift your hands toward heaven I believe the God that we serve the God that we worship is in this room we don't have to talk about him like he's far away but he's with us and whatever you need you can receive it tonight oh send your strength God
Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, singers and musicians, blessing us and ushering us into the presence of the Lord. I'm in his presence tonight. Praise God. And in his presence is fullness of joy. Praise God for his touch, his blessings, and his help tonight. Remain standing, if you will, please, for the reading of the word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 is my text tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. They shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to attain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as I, even as also ye do. I want to speak tonight on the subject, what in the world is going on? Would you pray and ask God's touch of anointing tonight? Father, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us with. Thank you for your divine visitation, for your unction, your anointing. Thank you for your touch that you have placed upon each of us. Lord, tonight I pray that you would move mightily 
in this service. Help us to recognize the urgency of this hour and the nearness of your coming. Help us, Lord, to be keenly aware of what's going on around us because we're not in the darkness. We're not in the night. We're children of the day and children of light. Help us to see the truth and to know it and apply it to our hearts and lives. I pray tonight, God, that you would stir us up. Help us, Lord, to live each day looking for your appearing, longing for your coming again. I pray for your anointing, your unction, your enablement tonight. I pray for the liberty in this service as we worship you and magnify you. Let your will be done tonight, for it's in the lovely and holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. What in the world is going on? That's a question that we hear quite often from a number of people. And it's obvious to children of God, to people who are in the day, people that are in the light, that this old world is wrapping up in a hurry. We're in the last days. This thing is winding down. And the word of God is leaping off the pages as we see prophecy after prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes. We're seeing things take place around the world that are unprecedented, things that are shocking. People talk about things being of biblical proportions. They talk about things that, that are totally abnormal from what they're accustomed to. There are things that are happening locally. There are things that are happening nationally. And there are things that are happening internationally and we're seeing a tremendous change, a turmoil that's taking place in the political arenas, a political turmoil that's causing people to ask the question, what in the world is going on? We've never seen anything like we're seeing now in the political arena. We now have a president in the White House that has been likened to King Cyrus of Isaiah chapter 45. It's just coincidence that he happens to be the 45th president of the United States. But he, King Cyrus in Isaiah 45, became the first emperor of Persia. King Cyrus was appointed by God with a task of liberating the Jews so that they could go back home from their bondage and rebuild the temple so they could return to their homeland. Isaiah 45 and 1 reads, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Even the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, implied that President Trump is Cyrus's spiritual heir. He thanked the president for moving the American embassy to Jerusalem. And this is what he said. We remember the proclamation of the great king Cyrus, the great Persian king. 2,500 years ago, he proclaimed that the Jewish exiles in Babylon can come back and rebuild our temple in Jerusalem. And we remember how a few weeks ago, President Donald J. Trump recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Mr. President, he said, this will be remembered by our people throughout the ages. And just the other day, I hope you saw it, I hope you watched it when he visited the White House, he said this, Mr. President, you have been the greatest friend that Israel has ever had in the White House. If there's any nation that we want to be friends with, it is Israel, God's chosen nation, God's God's chosen people. And I know there's some people that don't like it about the president. I know there's some that hate the president and they can't understand how he got in office, but oh, they don't understand how blessed we are as a nation not to have Jezebel sitting in the White House. They don't know how blessed we are not to have such a wicked person leading our nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach unto any people and people are saying what in the world is going on the political world is upside down unlike anything we've ever seen no 
one ever believe that Donald Trump, a successful businessman, will become the president of the United States? They mocked it. They joked about it. They still think the election was rigged. They still think that other nations were involved in how that he became president. But I want to tell you that God is still in control, that God is the one that puts up one and puts down another. He said in Daniel 2.21, he removes kings and he raises up kings. Psalm 75 and 7, he brings down one and he exalts another. God is still in control. People are scratching their heads and they're saying, how could this be? How could this take place? It doesn't make any sense. What in the world is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. God is still in control. He's going to do what he said he was going to do, that Israel will be declared a nation. He's going to protect Israel. He's going to use the United States to protect them from other nations and that's what he has done. When other presidents have turned against Israel, when other presidents, when other people have said we are not going to protect them, God said I'm going to protect them. I'm going to raise up somebody, somebody you think that would not deserve to be there but God has put him there for such a time as this. No one ever believed that Boris Johnson, a man with a bumbling demeanor, would become the prime minister of the United Kingdom who has led Britain out of the European Union with Brexit. No one ever believed that Volodymyr Zelensky, who was an actor and a comedian, but now he's the president of Ukraine. People are saying, what in the world is going on? How can this be? I tell you, God is up to something. God is doing something. God is moving in this the affairs of men. When men think we've got it lined up, when men think this is how it's going to be, God will interrupt their plans. God will make a way where there is no way. He'll open doors that no man can close. He'll do what no other can do. These are uncertain times. These are unusual times. Wherever you are, your world is about to change. Wherever you live, your world is about to change. Things are different. There's a difference. There's something unusual. There's something strange that is taking place. You can feel it and I can feel it. Things are just not the way they used to be. There's a difference in the air. There's a difference in the world. And no matter where you go, you can't feel relaxed. You can't feel at ease. You feel on edge all the time because we're on the brink of the coming of Jesus Christ. Something that's never happened is about to happen. An event is about to unfold like this world has never seen before. A tribulation is coming on the land like this world has never experienced. Most of us are longing for a time that is less stressful. We're longing for a time that is less complicated. And everybody wants to know what in the world is going on. Why do we feel this uneasiness? Why do we feel this uncertainty? It's because we're in the last days. It's because there's something set in motion that cannot be stopped. It's because God is at work in the land. He's working in the political arenas. He's working in the governments. He's working in the nations around the world. God's word is being fulfilled field just like he said that it would. God is shaking the nations. He says in Haggai 2 and 6, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. You see, we serve a big God. He's not a little God that sits on a counter in a restaurant. He's not a little God that's that's made unto a, a piece of wood or stone. But the Bible says he sits on the circle of the on the circle of the earth. He uses the earth as his footstool, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He measured out the heavens with a span of his hand. That's the mighty God that we serve that can shake the nations, who can just move his finger and devils have to be cast out. He's a mighty God tonight and he's able to move mightily upon the land. Life on planet earth as we know it will never be the same again. It's growing more and more uncertain every day. Nothing seems sure. Nothing seems stable. But I want to tell you tonight the only thing that is really sure is the rock of Jesus Christ. 
A rock of Jesus Christ is a sure foundation. People better get on board and they better get on the rock of safety. They better turn to God. They better get in church. They better get right with God because we're in for a bumpy ride. We're in for something that's going to be taking place in the next weeks and months that's going to be, that's going to be causing people to ask the question, what in the world is going on? God always sends warning before he sends judgment. He's touching hearts. He's touching minds. He's touching individuals. He's touching nations. He's raising up people so that he can speak his word to this world and warn them to flee from the wrath to come. There are still some John the Baptist around who are still proclaiming the word of God. There's still some Esthers who will go before the king unafraid of losing their life. There's still some people who will stand in the gap and make up the hedge and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God under salvation. Despite all that's happening in the world, the church is the one sure place of stability. You say, well, how could you say that, Pastor? Because Jesus said so. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You can be sure if the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church that hypocrites and false prophets and false teaching and charlatans cannot prevail against it either. His church is established. His church is steadfast. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for his pride. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Thank God for the church tonight it's important for us to know that it's not enough to be in the church because you can be in the church and still not be in Christ there are a lot of people who are in the church but they're not in Christ they don't believe the word of God they might go to church they might sing in the choir they might participate in the functions of the church but they're not in Christ that's the reason so many people are so fickle and so unfaithful, they're not in Christ. You can join every church in town and still be lost. It's not enough just to have religion. We've gotta have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is not something we just put on on Sunday and then take it off on Monday, but every day he abides. Every day we live with him, we walk with him, we talk with him. He is there to listen to us. He's there to help us. He's there to strengthen us. He abides, thank God, he abides with me. Praise God. You've got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're aliens. We're strangers. We're pilgrims passing through a foreign land. So we're to be separate we're to be holy, we're to be sanctified, we're the called out ones, the ecclesia called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. But many have fallen in love with this world. Fallen in love with the world that's passing away. Falling in love with the world. As the scripture says that they'll weep over Babylon. They'll weep and they say Babylon is fallen, is fallen and they'll weep because it's all going to pass away. Everything we see with our eyes is going to dissolve. It's going to be destroyed with a fervent heat. So don't fall in love with this world. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. But because of the love for this world, it's affected the message of the pulpit. Because people have fallen in love with the world, you're hearing sugar and spice sermonettes because we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to upset anyone. We don't want to bother anyone. So we give them a, a sweet, syrupy, feel-good sermon. Because if you preach against sin, you preach against the ungodly lifestyles that many are living, they'll get angry and they'll leave and they'll go away. They'll find somebody who will tickle their ears. But God give us those who will stand and preach the word regardless because God hasn't called us to become friends with this world. He's called us to be friends of God and to please God and to do his will. But pulpits today are filled with sermons on global warming and how to save the planet. Instead of preaching about repentance, we are seeing prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes. Right before our eyes, it's happening. It's, it's oblivious to so many people, but if you're living right and if you're listening to the Spirit, you can see it when you turn on the news. You listen to it and you hear the world and they're saying, what in the world is going on? And in your heart, you know we're, we're winding down. We know this thing is coming to a close. We know we're on the pre 
brink of eternity. We know that Jesus is coming. But because of the love for this world, it has affected our music. In the church, we don't know whether we want to sing country, rock, or opera. The church has been deluded because of the love of this world. We've replaced shouting with swaying and with choreographed dancing. That's how we've fallen in love with the world. The love of this world has affected our methods. Instead of setting the world on fire, the world is cooling the church off. Love for this world has affected many churches and brought in performing arts into the church. It's not unusual to find worldly music and theater and dance and amusement in the house of God. We're more concerned with impressing this world than we are about getting ready to leave this world. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. The old timers used to sing it. I don't want to get adjusted to this world, to this world. I don't want to drive down another tent peg and say, I want to stay here. I want to keep looking every day for Jesus to come. I'm longing for his appearing. I'm praying for his appearing. I'm looking for his appearing. Love for the world has caused many to become so adjusted here until they're no longer talking about the second coming of Jesus. They're no longer talking about the rapture of the church. They put it off and said he's not coming. Many, even in our ranks, no longer preach the imminent return of Jesus Christ. They no longer preach the rapture of the church. Jesus Christ, I believe with all my heart, is just before stepping out on the clouds of glory. I believe he's just before stepping out. So we better gird up our loins. We better make our make sure our lamps are trimmed and burning. We better know that we know that we're ready when Jesus comes. Paul writing to Timothy. He said, in the latter times, some will abandon the faith. They'll turn away from God. They'll be eager with itching ears to hear some deceiving spirit or some doctrine of devils. Jesus said in Mark 13, 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce. If it were possible, Jesus said, even the elect. What a powerful, what a strong delusion and deception that we're seeing in the world today. Jesus warned his disciples. He said, they'll come a falling away. They'll come a departure from the faith. Paul warned the Ephesians about savage wolves that would come in to devour the flock, to draw away disciples after themselves. You hear all these wild stories and bizarre stories. I've been in the church all my life and and all of a sudden we've got churches talking about angel feathers and gold dust and gold feelings and all kind of bizarre stuff and people are so naive to believe that. They're naive to listen to false doctrine and false beliefs yet the message is received greedily and readily by those who are naive and those who don't know the scripture, know this book, know the word of God. The spirit will will bear witness with you when it's the truth. You will feel it in your heart and you can say amen to it but oh when it's in error, when it's gone away from the word of God, leave it alone. You say, well, this person has a a great following. This person has a multi-million dollar um, ministry. This person is, is a household name. It doesn't matter who they are. If anyone else comes bringing any other gospel, let them be accursed. There's no other gospel. There is no other way. There's no other Jesus. There's only one Jesus, one gospel, one way, one truth, one cross. There's only one means, and that's through Jesus Christ. We all know how discouraging it is when we see professing Christians fall away. Even in the first century, there were those who were departing from the faith. And Paul was disappointed. And Paul said this, from the first century to the coming of the Lord to the end of the world, there's gonna be a falling away. There's going to be a departure from the faith. Some will be abandoning their faith because they've been deceived by evil spirits and wicked spirits. And we see this. and We say, how in the world can this happen? We hear about it all the time. We hear about pastors committing suicide. We hear about people that's been in the church for years that are falling away. And we wonder what has happened. What in the world is going on? Deceiving spirits have worked on their hearts and their minds. And it seems these days that no sooner than people come to the altar, they immediately begin to fall away. You have such high hopes 
Oh, here's a person that's wanting to serve God and live for God. Next thing you hear, they're back out in the world living in sin. And you say, what in the world is going on? <clears throat> Paul said, beware of wolves, deceiving spirits, and doctrines of devils. We're in the last days. What in the world's going on? These are the last days before Jesus comes. When you feel like giving up and throwing in the towel, you're being influenced by a deceiving spirit. A deceiving spirit is telling you to quit. A deceiving spirit is telling you to give up. You've come under demonic attack and the devil's trying to get you to back up and back away and to go away. You've got to get upon the word of God and say, I've come too far to turn back now. I've made up my mind. I've decided to follow Jesus no turning back, no turning back. The tempter, the angel of light, the deceiver, the devil, Diablo, the accuser of the brethren, he will come against you. He will take advantage of your difficulties. When you have trouble at home, when you have trouble at work, when you're having financial difficulties, when you're having problems with your health, the devil will take advantage of that. We cannot allow the pressures of this life to get to us. We've got to hold on to the faith. In spite of everything that's going on around us, Paul said we better wake up and we better sober up. These times should sober us. This is not a picnic. This is not a party. It's a war. We're in a fight. We're in a war. This is no time to be silly. This is a time to be sober. It's a time to seek God. It's a time to wake up. This is a time to get right with God and a time to get right with each other. People who are holding grudges, People who have unforgiveness in their hearts, they are not looking for the Lord to come. You want to get everything settled. You want to make sure everything's all right between you and God and you between you and someone else because people that are looking for the Lord to come, they're going to be like Abraham who's a friend of God. Thank God I'm a friend of God. They want to be like Enoch who walked with God. They want to be like Samuel who the Bible said lived a holy life before the Lord his God. They want to be like Jehoshaphat who prepared his heart to seek the Lord his God or to be like Barnabas who was a good man Man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Praise God. We want to make our calling and election sure. We want to make sure our lamps are, are trimmed and burning. We want to make sure our garments are clean and white. We want to make sure our hands are clean, our hearts are pure, and our minds are spiritual, and we have a clear conscience before God. We want to be right and ready for the rapture because it's about to take place. Today, people have become weary of the message of the rapture of the church. But nothing should excite us any more than to love his appearing. That should be the most exciting thing in our lives tonight. Not the Super Bowl, not the World Series, not golfing, not hunting, not fishing, not making money, not anything else should be as exciting to us than the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everywhere that early church went, we're talking all those centuries, we're talking about all those centuries ago. We're talking about those early church believers. Jesus had just gone away, but they immediately looked for his return. You'd meet them on the street. They weren't talking about anything but the coming of the Lord. It was in their message. It was in their letters. Jesus is coming. He's coming. Till he comes, they would say, he's coming. They would say, Maranatha, the Lord come up. He's coming soon. Keep your chin up. Keep pressing on. Keep fighting, keep looking up because Jesus is coming. That's what kept them going. That's what kept them persevering. They knew the Lord was gonna come in the midst of your fiery trial, in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your difficulty. Keep looking up and say, this could be the day that Jesus is coming because he said one of these days in the cock crowing, in the noon hour, in the evening time, as a thief in the night, the Son of Man come up, praise God. Get ready, get ready, Jesus is coming soon. Everything that's happening is pointing to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. There's fear everywhere. You can see it. You can hear it. People are angry because they can't understand what's happening. Look at what's happening in the nations. Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, North Korea, Israel. All these places are tinderbox. They're ready to be ignited. They're ready to explode. There's threats of nuclear war that are constantly going on, trying to get the materials to make a, a bigger nuclear bomb. No one trusts anyone anymore. Peace treaties are really not worth the paper they're written on. They cry peace and there's no peace for the wicked. He said when they cry for peace and safety, sudden destruction is gonna come upon them. We never know what Russia 
of what China is up to. There's unrest in the nations of the world. Then there's diseases, the CDC, the disease control centers. They are saying to us that at least one new disease is jumping from the species barrier from animals to human beings every year. Every year there's another, another pathogen. Every year there's another disease of bacteria. Three-fourths of these are originated from animal diseases. The latest virus from China, they believe, started with a snake. Started with a snake, came from a snake. You're seeing diseases come. They're jumping the barrier. And then what about the weather? Everybody talks about the weather, unusual weather patterns, unusual things happening in the weather. There's earthquakes. We've been having earthquakes and tremors all over the place in North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, all around. There's earthquakes. Some are small, but he didn't say what size they would be. He said there would be earthquakes in many places, in different places. And earth, the earthquake is shaking. The earthquake below around Cuba and Jamaica. These earthquakes are taking place. Tsunamis and hurricanes and floods and tornadoes, they're all becoming more and more common. And then there's wildfires that are destroying thousands of acres, destroying continents, devouring everything in its path. And then the political infighting that we're seeing, we've never seen anything like this where major political parties are rising up and ripping their nations apart. Pro professional politicians with long careers are suddenly engaging in open verbal warfare. We've never Never seen anything like this and people are saying what in the world is going on Jesus said I'll tell you when you see these things look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draweth nigh he said no these are our alarm bells going off no this is a siren that's sounding notice that these are the lights that are flashing when you see these things you better get ready because you're about to leave this world our Lord is coming back to earth again he's coming back to gather his redeemed He's coming back for his church and for his pride. When you see these things, look up because your, your redemption draweth nigh. Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. Oh, Salamorinda Bahoras. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He said, Look to the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise. When you see all these things, know that it's near even at the door. That's how near we are, the rapture of the church. Things are heating up. Things are tightening up. Things are getting very unusual. So he said, are you ready? Are you ready for his coming? Are you looking for his coming? For unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. While the heads are bowed just a moment, the saints are praying. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us once again of the lateness of the hour, the nearness of your coming. We know according to your word that we are in the last days and that we are running out of time. Our days are few and they're full of trouble. You said for us to redeem the time because the days are evil. All around us we see so much that's unsettled, so much confusion, so much anger, so much bitterness, so much frustration of living in this sin-cursed world. Lord, we're looking for and longing for the day when we'll be at rest with you forevermore. For you said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We know, Lord, there's coming a day when we'll rest from our labors. There's coming a day, Lord, when there'll be no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain. Lord, we long for that day of your appearing. We don't want to get adjusted here. We don't want to fall in love with this world. We want to be in love with you and serve you with all our hearts. Oh, God, we bless you and thank you for that glorious promise that you will come again. Hallelujah. Let me ask you tonight while the saints continue to pray, is there anyone here who has any doubt, any question? any uncertainty about being ready to meet the Lord. If the Lord comes for any of us tonight, he could come for all of us by means of the rapture. He could come for us tonight with an angel of death. But one way or another, life on this earth is not going to continue on forever as it is. It's going to come to an end. But the Lord has promised us 
There's a better day of coming, a better world coming. No more sin, no more devil, no more suffering, no more sorrow. We're almost there. We're almost there. You can almost see the lights of the city. We're almost home. Let me ask tonight, is there anybody here who is unsaved, maybe a backslider, somebody that's drifted from God, somebody that knows that you're not where you ought to be with the Lord? Would you come tonight, make your way to this altar and say, I want to know tonight that I'm ready to meet God. If I leave this world one way or another, I want to know that I'm ready to meet my maker. I want to know that my sins are under the blood. My name is in the Lamb's book of life. Would you come tonight? Is there anyone? You feel the need to pray. You feel the need to be saved. You feel the need to repent. You feel the need to cry out to God. He's waiting for you. He's longing for you to have fellowship with you. You can have a relationship with him that's so real and so wonderful. If you come to him, he will in no wise cast you out. The Lord is coming. People are saying, what in the world is going on? Now you know Jesus is coming. The word of God tells us these things will happen. And when they do happen, get ready. Look up your redemption draweth nigh. Would you come all over the building? Let's find a place to pray tonight. Let's seek his face. Do some personal examination. Ask the spirit of God to search your heart. Then pray for a burden for the lost. Pray for the conviction of the lost that they'll be saved before it's too late.
Praise God. Are you looking?